Good evening all and welcome. Cults. Terrifying. Mysterious. Dangerous. They can be some, none, or all of these things. But one thing's for certain. We're going to find that out now. So get comfortable, grab your hoods, and let the darkness take control. This happened to me around a year and a half ago. My boyfriend at the time and I were sitting in the living room of my apartment when I heard a knock at the door. My ex asked if I was expecting anyone, and I said no. But I could just take a look in case to see who was out there. He stayed on the couch while I looked through the people. The apartment was set up in a way that didn't allow him to see me from the living room to the front room. Outside, there were two people. One young African American man looked about mid 20s and a much older Asian woman who looked to be in her 60s. For whatever reason, I decided to open the door. When I opened it, the young man says, Hi, we are a part of so and so religion. And we would like to talk to you about it. I have a 50 pound dog who's trying to get out. So I said, Sure, hold on. I'll come outside because my dog's trying to get out. This was a huge mistake. I want to clarify that this was very out of character for me. However, I had recently become closer to God and just wanted to give these people a chance as I didn't believe any harm would come by just listening to what they had to say. I was stepping outside and closing the door behind me and was about to listen to what they had to say. They said something about how they pray to Mary instead of God because she was the one who birthed Jesus. I don't exactly remember what, but it was something like that. I thanked them for their time and then say something like, thanks guys, stay safe out there, and thought I'd leave it at that. The Asian woman visibly starts panicking and saying things I don't understand in another language. When I look to her partner to see what he has to say about her behavior, he says, no problem. Perhaps you want a pamphlet though. Uh, sure. Not wanting to be rude and also to do some research on the religion as I'd never heard of it before. The guy then says, okay, great. We have them in the car. You can come with us. We're parked right out front. At that moment, I start feeling weird. I lived on the third story of an apartment complex that really was not the best place and there were no cameras anywhere. Why would they just leave their pamphlets in the car if they were going to door to door? It wouldn't make much sense to have each person they intrigued come down to the car. And the parking spots outside my house were almost all handicapped and no one can park there. The woman grabbed my arm and started directing me to the stairs. In a split second, I say, you know what? I'm a Christian and I'm very happy with my faith, but thank you anyway. The woman again said something in a language I couldn't understand. And the man goes, are you sure we can get it to you really fast? We're parked right there. My heart genuinely sank into my butt. I started sweating and looking for ways to remove myself from her grasp and the situation entirely. I know I must have looked panicked and I was. What do I do? How do I get away from the immediate danger I just put myself in? I wasn't thinking and just blurted out that I was very sure, yanked my hand from the woman who ended up scratching me from her grasp and bolted inside. I locked the door behind me and told my boyfriend what happened. That's when he looks at me and he made a face that I've never seen him make before. He tells me about how that specific religion has been in the news for the last few weeks because women have been going missing. And the only thing they have in common is some of the neighbors saying they had been solicited by the group the same day or around the day or time the neighbor disappeared. I read some articles to fact check what he was saying and he was right. The police were saying that it might be in connection with a trafficking ring that was moving from neighboring cities and now was suspected to be in ours. It gets weirder somehow though. I seriously freaked out went straight to Facebook Live and shared with my friends because I wanted to warn whoever it was that I could. I set the privacy to public after the live ended and went on with my life still a bit shaken. 
one week later, I get a Facebook message from someone who is, I'm assuming, part of that religious group, telling me I need to take the post down, and she was not nice about it. After I said I wouldn't because I wanted to educate anyone who lives in my town, she told me I was a spoiled egg, and I would regret making that video. I was afraid and blocked her immediately, set the video to private and called the police. The police said they couldn't do much as I didn't have the make or model of the car they were in, and there was no proof that they had even come to my apartment or who it was. But here's the part that still freaks me out. When I went to show them the messages from Facebook, I went to unblock the lady. Her page was completely deleted. I still had the messages, but it was like talking to a little grey default profile picture. Even the name had changed to something that seemed to be the random strokes of a keyboard. I want to end this by letting you all know that I am no longer being as trustworthy as I was before. I know the things I should have done differently now, and get upset with myself as to how I acted. I'm afraid that they really are a trafficking ring. And so to all those people involved, please let's never meet again. I would like to share with you a story that I heard based on my experience helping out at the mosque for last year's celebrations of Eid al Adha. So I was there as a journalist working on a small island off the coast of Singapore. One of the islands have a small mosque, but they were organizing the lamb slaughtering event to give out to the poor. Many villagers consisting mainly of Muslims and Christians receive free meat on that day, which also contributes to the next event, which is a large feast, especially for the villagers. I got the chance to aid in that and get free food as well. However, one must understand that with a lot of goats, there will be a foul stench as there will be lots of blood coming from the butchering area. By nightfall, things would have been cleaned, of course. This story is told by one of the staff there that mentions a tale that will disturb me forever. There is this story that revolves around the mosque being used by an unknown cult to summon the goat woman. They would use the praying hall in the middle of the night to do some sort of satanic ritual before sacrificing a woman, most of the time a villager, to summon the goat woman. Usually they sacrificed a young girl around her 20s, a virgin, and she was stripped of all clothing before they ended it all for her. An axe is placed on the sacrificial altar and several red candles lit up before some chanting goes about. Then the spirit of a demon would enter the deceased's body and rise, placing a decapitated goat's head still fresh on hers. Blood would drip all over her body as she picks up the axe and goes after the villagers that killed all the goats. When coming after virgins, their bodies would be affixed to crucifixes and often left on the road for villagers to see. According to an old man that lived on the island, the cult consisted of satanic worshippers that suddenly came to the island and began performing their demonic rituals one day in the forest. Ever since then, there will always be strange noises coming from the forest, the sound of goats, the screaming of women, and the stomping of large creatures. Many people did go missing, but no investigations conducted were able to find them, and so cases went cold. The villagers managed to, of course, stop the demon with their exorcism and their firearms. They summoned a religious teacher to stop the demon while a priest from a nearby church also aided the villagers. However, the account varies, as some say that she escaped into the forest with her cult, coming out each night to end the life of young virgin girls. This could be the reason why most girls are given curfews, to protect them from the goat woman. I would always take the shortcut through a local cemetery from my friend's house to my house. I wasn't afraid of it. I knew the caretaker and all the dogs that roamed the place. So I'm on my way back. I get into the middle of the cemetery and I can see candles lit and people standing around it. I skirt around them and they are all chanting something in Spanish. I'm able to make out a few chickens in a pen, but they're all chanting and praying. The next day I return on my bike, go to the same spot, and find little bowls filled with chicken eyes and hearts. I was only around 17 at the time, 
but apparently I happened upon a group of people practicing Santeria. It freaked me out at first, and when I learned a little more about it, I realized it was not much to fear. Unfortunately, I didn't learn more about it for a few years. Creepy as hell, especially seeing the remains of the chicken the very next day. It was a calm, warm summer night in July. The first year of high school was over, and me and my two friends Marcus and Marcus were hanging out. The night sky was dark enough to see some stars, and there was stillness in the air. It was so still, as a matter of fact, that there was a complete absence of any wind whatsoever that night. It gave off an uncanny feeling that my friends and I seemed to ignore as we roamed the town streets looking for stupid fun things to do. After messing around for a very long time, we decided to take a break in the middle of a large outdoor sports complex that we had to pass through on our walk back to Marcus's house, where we had been hanging out earlier that day. At that point, it was a little after midnight, and we decided to sit far inside the complex on the curb of the road that goes through it. This road separates many of the sports fields from the dark, dense trees and woods that border all around the large secluded complex. We all happen to have been sitting in one of the most isolated parts of the complex, with only a large post above us to see. The light from it only reached across the road and stopped instantly against the wall of the forest on the opposite side of the curb we sat on. We sat there, staring into the trees in front of us, talking for another hour about things I can't remember, and sitting in our oasis of flickering lamplight. Little did we know what could have been lurking in the desert of pitch black darkness that encompassed us. Even with this almost sinister setting, we unknowingly found ourselves in. The night still continued to maintain its tranquil absence of wind, like a calm before the storm. Behind us was a large fence, a large field behind that, another fence, another large field behind that, and even more bordering trees behind that. All of it cloaked in a thick blanket of darkness, similar to the woods that loomed across the road directly in front of us. On the left side of us was that dead end of a road and some large metal crates. On our right side was down the road that led past more fences and fields, eventually leading to a parking lot in the exit. As we continued to talk through the night, still slightly amped up on caffeine from all the soda we drank earlier, I lost track of what my two friends were talking about and drifted my attention out of the conversation for a moment to check my phone. After that very moment, it was when I started to hear sounds multiple human-like voices coming from far behind us. If I had to guess where it was coming from, based on the direction and the volume, it was probably around the forest, where it meets the furthest field far behind us, somewhere hidden in the dark. What I heard was a very eerie chanting in a language I'd never heard. Whatever it was, I could tell that multiple people were chanting it. And it was giving me serious negative energy that sent chills down my spine. I kept looking at my phone trying to tune it out and focus my attention on some memes, but it was too chilling to ignore. I then turned to look at my friends, hoping to jump back into the conversation and forget about the voices, but before I did this I suddenly realised they had already stopped talking too. When I turned silently to both look at them, I then saw that they too had also turned, looking back at me with the same spooked facial expression. My friend Marcus says, Dude, do you hear that creepy chanting? I reply, Yeah, it's freaking me out. At the exact moment I said that, as if on cue, an immense gust of wind rips through the trees in front of us, spiralling in extreme commotion, tearing through the once calm air. The canopies of trees surrounding all around us were shaking and bending in the wind, with the sound of leaves rattling loud as ever, and the continuous chanting that still lingered in the distance. All three of us immediately and simultaneously stood up at the exact same time. It was as if a lightning strike of fear had jolted up us, and right as we got up, 
and before we could even say a word, a sudden extreme loud sound blast from within the roaring forest right in front of us. The best I can compare it to is a combination between a gong being hammered and a scream slash growl and low rumble. But even that description is an understatement. The sound was otherworldly and still haunts me to this day. That was it. Me and my friends didn't know what to say to each other, nor looked at each other. We all knew we needed to get out of there, and we needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. In almost perfect synchronization, we all unanimously turned, swung ourselves over the fence to the right of us in one jump and straight into a soccer field, where we sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. I never ran so fast in my life. I wasn't thinking about anything but the utter shock of what had just happened. My body practically carried me across the dark void of terror that was the field. We were running in the direction of Marcus's neighborhood, just to get to the safety of his house. As we were running, the wind is still furiously blowing and I still hear the faint, distant chants cutting through the breeze. Out of the corner of my eye I see a blur of flickering candle lights in an organized formation near the tree border, in the distance behind us. We eventually had to crawl through a hole in another fence to get out of the field, and then we ran full speed all the way through some foliage to get to Marcus's house. We entered the house, slammed the door shut, locked it, and collapsed on the couch. To this day, I am still disturbed by that night, still question what those voices were, and how the wind kicked up so quickly and furiously. The origins of that otherworldly sound and the near perfect synchronized order of the phenomenon. My personal theory is that the chanting was a form of distant demonic ritual that conjured up some type of otherworldly portal very close to us. Who knows though, what really was going on there that night. I'm just glad we got away. My husband and I were passing by this big glorious white building that resembled Greek and Roman architecture like it was a museum. It was so beautiful and stood out against the landscape that you simply couldn't miss it. So we decided to park and check it out, looking for possible date ideas. The outside had a massive fountain that a bride and groom were taking pictures in front of. Then a robed woman, I'll call her tour guide, approached us and welcomed us to the church. The robe was a little weird for me, but I figured she may have been in a choir. We tried to leave, but the tour guide insisted on giving us a presentation. We really didn't want to listen, but were just being polite. She took us to a room with a giant Jesus statue and everyone in the building except me and my husband and a few others were all dressed in the same robes. That's when I started getting an eerie feeling. After the presentation, the tour guide lady took us into another room, where there was a giant globe and many Bibles in different languages. We then had a discussion about spirituality and that we weren't big church people due to our schedules. She mentioned that the followers of this specific church had no issues attending because the church provided them with houses and food and that the followers of the church were all related to the founder. Then the girl had a glow in her face and said, you may have connections to our founder. We were very interested and have our own refined ancestry system to find your long lost relatives. She said that to us and that was enough red flags for me. I took my husband by the hand and said, we need to go now. I started to thank her for her time and we began to leave. And an older woman in a white robe invited us to stay while we were on our way out the door and then insisted that the other girl would have the ancestry test done rather quickly. I told her we had other matters to attend to like a doctor's appointment, and then she politely said that we were always open if we had any more questions and handed us reading material. I then pulled out Snapchat due to a notification, and our tour guide peeked over my shoulder and said, Oh Snapchat, I haven't seen that in the past 11 months. Come to think of it, I haven't even seen a phone. I got chills of it and we sped out of the parking lot, never to return. Back during the summer of 2017, I was a very stubborn teenager and had no car nor driving license at the time. 
So my way of going to my friend's house, or anywhere in general, was that I would always walk to my destination. Occasionally my brother would drop me off at the location I would go to. The city I live in isn't too big, and is known for its gangs and drug problems. One afternoon, I put on my earbuds and wanted to get out of the house to meet my friend at a local park, which was an additional 15 minute walk. My neighborhood is a gated community. There are two doors to enter and exit from. One leads to the main street, and the other leads to an alley behind a middle and elementary school. To make the scenery creepier, the school used to be part of a historical Japanese cemetery. There were rumors about paranormal activity and cult activity happening in the area. My mentality at the time was naive, and I brushed off these rumors. Anyone would assume it's gossip. The neighbors would say to get the neighborhood kids to go into their homes early. I take the door that would take me to the main street. And as soon as I cross at an unmarked crosswalk, I bump into a guy wearing a long red hooded robe. No, not the ones people used after taking showers or for a cover up. It was a legit stereotypical cult robe. I made eye contact with the guy for just a second and noticed his eyes were pitch black. He had no visible pupil. My first thoughts were damn this guy must be high on meth. Even in the city center, everyone is always on drugs and it's pretty easy to identify what a person's on. But in his case, it was the contrary. On his lower left eye, he had a tattoo with a pentagram symbol. He looked like he was 25 and really tall, at least 6'1". Through my loud music, I could hear his heavy breathing and it sounded very abnormal, like some sort of strange growl. A sensation I had never heard nor experienced before. About a week had passed and I had completely forgotten about the creepy encounter, the one I had with said guy. My friend calls me one Friday afternoon and tells me to go to hang out at her house to smoke ourselves stupid and enjoy a six pack. As my usual routine goes, I put on my earbuds and walk to the destination, which is nothing out of the ordinary. I get to my friend's house, we have our sesh, get together, and after a few hours of drinking and getting high, I decide to call it a night, not being wary of the time. I realized how late it was and left her house in a hurry, roughly 11.30 PM. I had my earbuds on as always, and I get to the beginning of the back street slash alley, which is the second entrance to my neighborhood. As soon as I passed the end of elementary school, I had a bad unsettling feeling that I was being watched. I felt like a deer trapped knowing that there's a predator around. I always carry a sort of weapon due to terrifying predicaments I've been involved in in the past. It's on the right side of my waist and I have it ready in case anything fishy is about to go down. This weapon in particular was a pocket knife and anyone who's ever owned one knows it makes a particular clicking sound. As I got closer to the parked cars, I stopped in the middle of the road where the last street light was lighting. I looked ahead between the cars and the second entrance and there was a guy in a black robe crouched behind a truck. I kept walking in the middle of the road just because I'd have enough time to make a run for it. This strange guy emerges from the truck breathing heavily and it reminded me of the encounter I had last week. He walks up close to me and we make eye contact again. This is when I notice it's the same guy. I easily identified him because of his under eye tattoo. He stood there staring at me like I had just ruined something for him. He saw what was in my hand. He stares at it for a few seconds and then begins walking away breathing heavier than before. It almost sounded animalistic. I started to power walk to the entrance. In utter horror, I turn around to see another man emerging from behind another vehicle. I close the door behind me and quickly hide by the closest yard, as each yard has a brick wall separating each house. I stay there for a minute trying to process what the hell I just encountered, get on the phone and was about to call my friend in a panic, when I suddenly heard a conversation going on behind the wall I was hiding. The man went, why didn't you just go for it? It was an easy target. A different voice speaks up. She had a knife. It was going to end up messy. After that, I ran home, petrified. When I arrive home, my dad noticed I was frantic. I tell my dad that nothing's up 
and that I had seen a possum creep up on me. That's why I was scared. He believed that, and I haven't told any of my family what really occurred. It just gives me chills. Till this day, the thought of not carrying my small weapon terrifies me. God only knows what the hell those cult members were really planning on doing that night. I personally believe they were planning on trapping an innocent person to do some sinister, creepy activities. I work at a movie theater in Michigan, and recently we hired a new facilities manager, which is fancy wording for a maintenance man. He's an older guy in his 50s with long white hair and always has a weird look in his eye. He's called Alex. When he first started working here, he talked to me and one of my managers who I'm pretty close with. He was very interested in making movies. My manager and I hoped to make movies one day too, so this conversation didn't seem too weird, until it did. Every day he would try and find me or my manager to talk our ears off for long periods of time about how he has made big sounds for Hollywood movies and how he has so many connections. Eventually he began telling us that he has a studio at his house and he would try and get us over separately. He added both of us on Facebook as well and went by the name Alex Crowley. If you don't know who he is, he's a satanic cult leader. I think he was the first one in the UK. He did some very dubious things in the 1940s. After stalking his page, he follows weird neo-fascist pages and is really into devil worship, so his name is very fitting. Once he added us on Facebook, he would constantly send us message after message. Some of them were audio messages of what sounded like Latin or someone speaking backwards. I never replied to these. He would soon confront us for not responding to these messages. While he would send these, he would like and comment on my Facebook posts even from some years ago. While he was confronting us, the conversation would come back up about going to his house. He had access to our work schedules. He knew when our days off were. And he would say, so I see you have Wednesday off this week. What are you doing? You should come over to my studio. This happened every day. If I didn't see him up to that day off, the next time I worked, he would say, so you had that day off yesterday. Why don't you come over? He did the same thing to my manager, who's 24. He even told him to bring a swimsuit and asked what kind of beer he liked to drink. A few weeks go by, he's still pursuing us, but now he's added two more of my co-workers to his creep list. After the same stuff with them, one day my manager and I were working together and he comes up saying that he put a picture of the A24 logo on his Facebook. Alex put it there because he is supposedly making a sequel to the movie It Follows 2014 with them. He started saying how I needed to go to Detroit with him to be in the movie, and my manager would be the editor of it. The next day after he must have realized Google exists and tried to go back on what he said. Alex told us how the director was fired from A24 when AWOL deleted his Facebook and Twitter and only reached out to Alex because there was no one else he wanted to talk to. He told us this director would be blacklisted from Hollywood as his last movie flopped. Apparently, when your movie is bad, you're never allowed to work in the industry again. At this point, both me and my manager are exhausted from dealing with him and can't stand working with him. I asked one of my fellow co-workers who I knew he was talking to if he ever weirded him out. He said, of course. Alex wants to go out with this 18 year old co-worker fencing since that was a sport my co-worker was into. Luckily, his mum was Alex's boss and he told her the very next day he was fired. You know, he could have just been a deranged individual, but something creepy and sinister that's too hard to eloquently put into words was going on there. I'm sure of it. So to the strange satanic maintenance man, let's never meet again, whatever your intentions were. This happened to me when it was my 19th birthday. My friends make me a party in the west part of the city in a private place called Gran Jardin. 
This is in Mexico, by the way. It's a really expensive place where a lot of the people that are rich in that area live. The party ends at around 3.10 in the morning. I was leaving, and before I get into my car, I found a few things. There was a scarf on the front door, and weird stuff appeared on the front of my car. A handprint, but it wasn't normal, it was really large. It didn't even look human. After that, I get into the car and leave. When I was roughly seven minutes from my house, I was passing the community cemetery, just like any other day, except that my car stopped in front and it just switched off. It completely stopped. It was dead. It was a Honda Civic, I think. And it could be the motor, the battery, but I really wasn't sure. I get out the car, open the door, and was looking around to see what it could be when I start hearing a strange noise coming from the cemetery. That's when I see people, in all black, wearing masks on their faces. I jump right back in my car, close it, and lock it. The people ignore me. I try turning on my car, but it doesn't move. I am absolutely terrified when I saw the door to the cemetery open, and a lot of them make two lines and I'm really afraid. Are they gonna target me? Imagine you're 19, stuck in front of a cemetery with random people. You're like a deer in the headlights. The men point at me. People start surrounding my car. The tallest of the bunch is in front of it. All the while, I'm desperately twisting my key in the hope that the car turns on. All the people were trying to open the doors, hitting the windows, and I was in tears. It was at that moment that my car miraculously turned on. I put the car in gear and pushed the accelerator. I was expecting to hit someone, but nothing happened. I saw the guy in front, but it was like I went through him. When I looked behind me, in my rear view mirrors, there was no one. I arrived home really scared. I don't really know what to think. I wasn't high, I wasn't drunk. This wasn't a hallucination. Those people were there, and then in a blink they weren't. What the hell was going on that night at the cemetery? I got chased by a cult once when I was a teenager running around at 2am with my friends. But that was near population and I've run across ritual locations where whatever they summoned wanted an offering from me, way out in the Sierras. A bit of background. I grew up on a hill that was only about 300 feet tall, to the east of the Silicon Valley. I could see the valley looking west and a large lake looking east with no roads or anything all around to Highway 5. A rich dude purchased land for a golf course and country club which was around a quarter of a mile from my home. It was one of the kinds with tennis courts, golfing, several pools and a hot tub, five yurt type round buildings with different functions, weightlifting aerobics and party spots. There was also an extremely tall building a bit further down past the swimming pool for wedding events and the like. We at a certain point began calling it Motel Hell. This was when I was around five and we went there a lot at some point, the developer decided to abandon it. The pools turned green and then dried up. We were in our early teenage years at this point, running around toilet papering neighbors, running about in the middle of the night, thinking we were invincible, shooting flare guns, doing things that would get you thrown in jail. Sad to see how things have changed. We had seen the ritual drawings and such in various locations around the place and learnt about some of them from the library. Sometimes we would go to the ex party place and there would be large drawings on the floors and the walls. We would notice that even if it was 100 degrees outside, it would still be freezing cold to the point you'd nearly see your breath. We knew people were there at night because our bus stop was in the parking lot and we would spend morning breaks with many hundreds of bottles left sitting around by the older teenagers at night. Anyway, we were out running around around 2 a.m. one Friday. We could see lights at the club and decided to sneak up through the golf course from the back because there were some more bushes and trees. We crept up, 
got in earshot and sight and saw them performing a ritual. After a few minutes of observing them, one suddenly turned in his robes and pointed out into the darkness towards us. Not sure what he said, but they all sprinted out towards us. Not like they could catch us, but they tried for a good hour. Safe to say I tried avoiding that area from there on out. This happened just when I finished college. Me and my buddy lived way out in the sticks, a little village that no one's ever heard of, so I'm not going to bother mentioning it. There were always rumors that in the local woods, cult activity happened at night. We never bought it. It's the kind of thing that children say in middle school to scare each other and will tell each other at camp that one time something happened that they saw someone in a robe or something. I don't know. I never paid any heed to it. So anyway, my buddy and I are there one night, just talking and chatting. And one of us has the bright idea to go for a midnight walk. There was a beautiful path nearby that was always lit through the night, popular with cyclists during the day. It was a calm and tranquil kind of night. And we both being bored decided to light up a cigarette on our way and carry on our conversations as neither of us were tired. It was quite late at night already dark out. And as we started walking and chatting, an ominous and dark feeling overcame me. As you can imagine, I wasn't best pleased by this and looked around looking for the culprit of such a sensation. But I found nothing. I decided to just be a bit more wary that night. And I didn't want to ruin the vibe. We carried on walking. And the conversations were flowing naturally. We were having a really good night. I was getting a bit tired and knew that after our walk, I would probably turn in and just pass out on his sofa. We're about halfway through this walk when all of a sudden he goes, Shh, dude. I look around, don't see anything. And he puts his hand on my mouth and the other on the shoulder and pushes me down to the ground. We slowly step back off the path and he looks me dead in the eyes and gives me a look that says, stay quiet. I crouch behind a tree, really unsure what the hell's going on. That's when we see about eight to 10 people on bikes. They're quite far away at this point. So I'm thinking it's quite silly that he's making us hide off the path for cyclists. As I said, it was illuminated. But these people were all wearing robes. And I don't mean like a bathrobe. I mean, they were all wearing proper dark robes, black robes, like the robes you see characters in video games wearing. I thought this was all a joke, maybe something he'd set up elaborately. But they all go past. And you know what they were acting perfectly normal. They were talking and just cycling fairly chilly. I and my friend after a minute or so that they'd passed, get up and ask him if that was some kind of prank. It seemed all a bit too, you know, laid back. He tells me that he thought that the rumors from school were nothing but that rumors, but that it's clear to see that there is something fishy going on. He says that we should follow them to see what they're up to. By this point, the adrenaline that had coursed through me had perked me up a little bit. And in our stupidity, we decided to see if we could follow. Deep down, I thought that they must have been going quite far if they were on bikes, but entertained the idea that my friend had. It was probably about a four minute walk when we found the bikes discarded by the side of the path. There was a small clearing up ahead and a little dirt path that the cultists had obviously walked upon. At this point, I start getting chills. What if more arrive and we're caught in the middle of some cultist fiasco or something? I really didn't want to stick around for that. But my friend said that they were already doing something and to look up ahead. It was up a small hill. I could already smell fire. And we were hiding a little bit off the path, going up the trees ever so slowly just to see what they were doing. When we reach the top, we're crouching behind trees hidden in absolute darkness far off the path and their fire. 
we stare in curiosity at a bunch of people in robes dancing around the fire, and one guy right next to the fire chanting out of a book. It was literally like a scene taken directly from a movie. Part of me wanted to believe that there was someone filming, and this could have been part of a student film, but they were all very keen in their activity. After a while, the chanting and dancing stops, and the guy in the middle starts speaking nonsense words that neither of us understand, but I would assume were probably Latin or something akin to that. At that point, my friend and I think it might be time to hightail it out of there. But just as we agree to that, do the cultists all of a sudden stop? In silence, they get into single file and start leaving, the fire dying down. The main man, as I'm going to refer to him as, says some words over the fire and proceeds after them in a straight line, almost like kids lining up at school. They each grab their bike and start cycling away, like nothing had ever happened. We're left, confused and dazed. We give it about half hour before we even make a move, just in case they stuck around. But when we were confident that they had finally left, do we go up to the embers of the fire and see if there's anything suspicious. And with that, we go home and call it a night. Nothing innately creepy or sinister happened, but I wonder what the hell they were doing and practicing. And more importantly, what would have happened to us? And if we'd have found ourselves on the same fire, had they identified us watching their little gathering? Who knows? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. It's Mort, I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. If of course you did, you know what to do. Huge thanks as always to the cult of the Let the Darkness Take Control. Joking. I mean my members and my fellow patrons. Your support is invaluable. Help keeps the channel running, so thank you. If you want to find out more, info's in the description, you get some cool perks for signing up can find out if you're interested. Oh, cults are dangerous, guys. I mean, we didn't have any this time around about brainwashing cults or anything like that. And, well, I don't want to offend anyone when I say this, but if it's a fact, well, it simply is what it is, regardless. So, my cousin grew up going to school with, with these girls. Um, because they're girls, two girl cousins of mine, and this other girl that they they were like they knew and they were somewhat friends with, and they had like a, their dad had like a decent business going on. Then he joined Scientology, and well, I guess they helped him out, um, and his his business really boomed. And then he went to live in the states, and I think he took his girls um, to the states as well, and. He, they invited some friends of the school, one being a girl in particular, to go and, you know, like, chill with the other girls. Um, you know, this is not Scientology related yet. But when she was out there, they indoctrinated her into Scientology. I think she was like 15, so underage. I don't know if it's illegal to do that. But more importantly, she wasn't allowed to come home for six months. You know, it was like they never flew her back. She wasn't, she didn't go on the flight she was supposed, she was supposed to. The, her parents weren't allowed to communicate with her and it's only until like, obviously police, when it comes to different countries getting involved, it got quite messy. Was she finally, you know, allowed to come back six months later? But by that point she was fully immersed into Scientology. Now, if there are any Scientologists out there, well, you know, I, I don't want to offend you or upset you or anything, but this is just something that my aunt has told me, and I mean, it's pretty creepy. Like, no religion or anyone should hold you against your will. Um, and the girl did say quite explicitly she was held against her will, and she got home. But yeah, creepy stuff, guys. Creepy stuff. Stay safe out there. Stay away from cults. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.